I'm very pleased to introduce to you uh, two of our folks from SANS. Uh, as you can see here, Kevin Garvey is one of our instructors for our, our Management 512 course. And Frank is one of our fellows at SANS, which is the highest tier of, of instructors that we have. Frank is, is also the curriculum lead for our cloud track as well as our management courses. And uh, I was really excited to bring them here to specifically talk about this because so many times we have the question of, you know, oh, I see this entry level job being advertised and it, it's for, you know, an entry level job with 70 years of experience doing things in a technology that's only been around for like six months, right? I'm only being a little bit facetious in that. Uh, certainly is a challenge that a lot of folks have. How do I show that I have experience when I have the work experience? Feels like a catch-22 in many ways. Well, I'm really glad to be able to give you uh, to this talk, which is going to hopefully help to overcome that. So without any further delay, Kevin, Frank, please uh, take it away. And I'm very excited for what you've got for us today. Hey, thanks a lot, Phil. Appreciate it so much. We're really excited to be here. Now, just to set the stage, everybody, this is going to be a little bit of a unique session here is Kevin is going to share a lot of his insights on, well, how do you go about gaining experience in cyber without any experience? And, uh, you know, I'll be here to kind of help uh, take some questions and interject as Kevin is going along in the presentation. So as you know, here in Slack, feel free to please um, chime in at any point with comments. We want to try to make this interactive, as interactive as possible. So if you have any questions, comments, thoughts along the way, you know, I will be looking at all of those and relaying them back to Kevin here and in trying to inject them into the conversation. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and pause myself here and um, come back in a moment. And Kevin, I'm going to turn it over to you. And, you know, I'll be back um, once we get uh, some questions. Yeah, absolutely, Frank. Thank you so, so much. And I am really excited to have a conversation with you about some of those creative ways that everybody on this bridge might be able to gain some cybersecurity experience. And know that I've gone through exactly what you are going through right now, where I'm looking up, I'm trying to see how I can get into the cybersecurity world, how to get into that cybersecurity mindset. And I was thinking to myself, how exactly can I do it? And I was left with some creative ways that I'm going to share with you along the way in order for you to not just get some of that experience, but also gain confidence in that experience as you start looking at some of your entry-level cybersecurity jobs. So I'm going to start off with something that might surprise you a little bit. Every single one of you who's on this call right now has a cybersecurity mindset. Now, why do I say that? Well, we do a lot of things that you probably think of as second nature, such as well, you protect your personal accounts and you protect your passwords. I bet you if I were to get a show of hands in a room, most of you probably have a what you deem to be a fairly secure password. You might even have multi-factor authentication on some of those. I might be throwing out terms here that you know we're going to talk about a little bit later, but know that what you're doing right now it parallels to what we do in the enterprise world of cybersecurity. You protect your data. Hey, if you got a, an alert or a notification stating that your social security number or your name or other personally identifiable information was out and loose somewhere and it was out of your possession, you'd be nervous about it. You would go into some type of incident response mode. And ah, just surprisingly, that parallels just slightly to what we do in the enterprise environments as well, when we start looking at how we respond to data breaches from an organization. And you also look at emails with a bit of suspicion, right? Oh, when you see an email that states you've won $2 million, you might get up and scream for joy, but then you realize, hmm, this is probably a scam of some capacity. So you put a mental pause on looking at that email and maybe clicking that link that you, you sort of know is probably malicious. You might be a little curious in it, but you know in your cybersecurity mindset goes on, you say, I'm not going to click that because I do not know where this email came from. Another one I see all the time, you know, you'll be able to have some type of magical weight loss along the way. There's tons of great spam or even malicious email attachment examples. But what I'm getting at before I go into any of the skills that I believe are necessary for cybersecurity is that every one of you have those skills already. So I'm really hoping to pull some of that great skill set that you already have out of you. And you could showcase that as you start applying to some of these roles that really are of interest to you. 
And, and Kevin, you know, hey, sorry to interrupt your flow here. I just wanted to chime in here and say, hey, number of people in Slack are chiming in with some great examples. Hey, you know, hey, they got contacted about a charge on their credit card. Amazon is contacting them about a suspicious charge, tracking their tech uh, package. Uh, Microsoft tech support, right, has found an issue. Their system is compromised. And, you know, similarly, a lot of times uh, mother uh, invent, uh, necessity is the mother of invention. You know, at home, we protect our, uh, we, we lock down our, daughter, our kids' uh, iPads, for example, with a screen time passcode. And I have caught my 10-year-old daughter trying to brute force guess the screen time password an untold number of times. So yeah, definitely, you know, this, this concept of having a cybersecurity mindset already to some degree, right, is an excellent thing that you highlight. So yeah, sorry for uh, jumping in there, Kevin. No, absolutely, Frank. And Frank, I look forward to seeing your daughter in the Management 512 class one of these days. They're really going <laughs> on some of those cybersecurity skills. Well, I'm really glad you brought that up because I'm going to go into the topics of today. So I'm going to approach it, and I've, I've heard this theme from many of the topics today as well talking about those soft skills. And that's what I also want to gain the confidence in for is to showcase, hey, what you bring to the table already is actually incredibly important and do not discount that. So I'm going to try to distill and pull out for everybody within this bridge to figure out what you actually can bring to the table right now without any of that technical experience. However, we are absolutely going to talk about some of that technical experience as well. And some of the themes that I've heard from many of the folks that have joined the industry is that, hey, I had technical experience in one area, but maybe it wasn't something that paralleled well to a cybersecurity region. Or another great example is I just don't know where to start. There is no problem if you don't know where to start. I'm gonna give you some examples that really are gonna build up some of that base technical knowledge for you that you can do not only at home, but also for free as well. So think about it in a logical sequence. These are the skills that you already have. You're gonna be able to hone in and practice some of those skills outside of the office. And then when you get that coveted cybersecurity job, you're gonna be able to gain some of that hands-on experience. A great example of this is when I was sitting at my first cybersecurity job. I had some skills that we're gonna talk about, ready? I was able to practice, and I heard in some of the other speeches about vulnerability management and setting up a vulnerability scanner. I was able to have a good communicative response to one of the interview questions about vulnerability management. But did I have that true vulnerability management enterprise experience? I'll let you in on a secret. I didn't exactly have that experience, but I had some of that hands-on experience. I ended up getting that role, but I bring that up because the third pillar of what we can get do to gain that experience is then build those skills through that hands to keyboard knowledge at a role. But let me take a step back and talk a little bit about myself. So my name is Kevin Garvey. I also am an IT security operations manager for a financial organization. And there are many different functional areas that you've heard of today that I ultimately have to answer to, to make sure that we're running at peak performance at all times, not just operationally, but also from a security perspective as well. I also have the pleasure of teaching Management 512 Security Essentials for Managers. And one thing I'd love for you to take away from this is that you might think, especially if you haven't had the chance to take a SANS course, oh, there's all these great and skilled, you know, tenured cyber professionals in every SANS class. And maybe I feel a little bit overwhelmed by taking the course. Well, I'm here to tell you, and one of the reasons why I love teaching Management 512 is that we get a great subset of folks who take the course. And I love having conversations with them. You know, some folks come in from a technical background. You know, and they're able to not only showcase that technical area, but they want to you know, have that cybersecurity twinge interchanged with what they're currently working on right now. And then on the other side of the spectrum, I've got great students who have done very well in their industry. They've never touched a computer before. They've never touched a cybersecurity product before, but either they have interest in it or they were told, well, you're going to have to build up a cybersecurity program. And I love hearing all the different perspectives of everybody from the class. So know that we have such a great subset of students in there. You know that you, know, you have the opportunity to take Management 512. No, you, know, you don't have to know every last thing that comes into the class. We're going to be able to teach that to you on the way. I have some experience in the financial media and also the utility sector, all under a cybersecurity either leadership area or as an individual contributor. Now, another thing I wanna to bring to your attention too is I've interviewed hundreds of people for a cybersecurity role. 
And I could probably spend another eight hours talking about some of the great stories I could probably share with you about some of the interviews that I've had and conducted along the way. And we're gonna go into some of the lessons that I've learned as an interviewer, and hopefully you could take those as somebody who is going to be interviewing for a cybersecurity role. I also volunteer and mentor with some organizations that are, well, they're either cybersecurity aligned or they're not cybersecurity aligned. And that's gonna make a little bit more sense as I go forward and talk about some of those soft skills and getting that experience along the way. Importantly, I'm a finance major. Look at this, I'm dressed in a, a white button up right now. Yeah, when I go to work every day, well, before COVID, I wore something very similar. It was yeah, almost like a suit. How did I get into cybersecurity, right? Well, there's a little bit of background that I would love to get into. So I graduated college in 2008 and very similar to 2020 and 2021, unfortunately, well, there was a bit of a downturn in the economy. So here I am with my finance diploma, no jobs. Everything that I had done in order to get experience really went to the wayside very quickly. But I also have loved IT in anything computer oriented for quite a long time. So what I did, well, before I knew that there was gonna be a recession in 2008, is I joined my help desk as a part-time worker at the university I was attending. And I loved it. I got to meet some great people. I got to meet folks who were you know, system admins, who were network admins. And I also got to meet some customers on the way as well, students or the professors that were coming in. I bring this up because I was noticing very quickly when people were coming into the desktop area and they were asking me, hey, Kevin, I've got a virus on my computer. And if we remember way back when, this was probably back in 2006, viruses were a little less stealthy at the time. You sort of knew with your Windows XP machine that you were infected with something. So people would open up their computer, there were pop-ups all over the place. And I would look around at the rest of the folks at my desk and they were great workers. But what they wanted to do is really just switch out that hard drive and put a new hard drive in. And I found myself telling the folks on the other side of the counter, well, why don't you stay a little while? I sort of want to find out what happened. And I would start, I don't think grilling them is the right word, but I would ask them, Hey, what did you do when you started seeing some of these things pop up on your computer? Hey, were you trying to open up this application or was it an email that you were trying to open up? Did you see that there were any weird connections going on? Some folks really were very, very technical at the help desk as well. And I had good conversations with them. But the moral of that story was, I was really starting to bud my interest in cybersecurity without even knowing it. I was going through Windows event logs. I was looking at some of the network telemetry from the events that we were seeing on just a regular laptop. And I was even more interested in what was the bad actor thinking, trying to make this virus or make this malware or make something that was essentially stopping this customer from being able to do their day-to-day -day work. What ended up happening is sometimes the students would be there for three hours. Now, if any of those students are on the webinar right now, I apologize. I know that I was probably being a little selfish as I was looking at what and what was wrong with your computer, but I loved making sure that I could dig a little bit more into it. So that curiosity really came into play just starting at a help desk level. And that started growing throughout my career as well. Another thing that I would love for everybody to take away too, especially if you have that opportunity to be in an office environment or to work remotely within an office environment is networking. So a great example of networking, especially in that school role was, you know, I'd like to say that we were busy 100% of the time. I'll probably put it at 65 to 70% of the time we were actually busy. Well, what did we do with that other 30%? Well, myself, my friends, we were curious about some of the other technologies that as a help desk individual, I didn't have any access to. I didn't have any access to the Network Operations Center. I certainly didn't have any access to any of the cybersecurity tools. So you know what I did? I started getting to know some of those folks. And if I saw a ticket that would come in, or if I saw that there was a piece of malware that I just wanted to discuss with somebody, I would bring it up with the network administrator. I would bring it up with the system administrator and say, hey, you know, are you seeing something on your, on your tools that is collaborating with what I'm seeing on my side? Or are you seeing that this is growing in some capacity? And hey, by the way, I've got a little bit of time if you want. You know, I could join you, you know, buy you a cup of coffee. I'll join you while you start doing your searches. And that was one way I was able to get past 
not having any access into some of these tools that, yeah, technically you would see on a resume along the way. And then also training as well. And Frank, I see that you, uh, you might have a question. Kevin, hey, you know, you are on a roll. You've already just shared a bunch of great information and it has led to a lot of great comments and questions here in the Slack channel and people bringing up lots of great points. And I loved how you framed it on a prior slide is, hey, what's this progression? How do you build on? What are the skills you have today? What are the skills you wanna practice? And then what are the skills that you wanna find and get experience for? That is great, <clears throat> excuse me. And I love how you're pointing out your personal journey here in terms of being, this, being a finance major. And I've worked with a number of colleagues over the years. And that's one great thing about cyber is that many of us, we all come from different backgrounds. I've worked with people from finance, from accounting, from people with philosophy backgrounds, philosophy degrees, history majors, and so on. And uh, you know, one of the things you were just mentioning was, hey, build a relationship. And you know, people were mentioning here in Slack about you know, kind of imposter syndrome and not feeling like perhaps they belong or finding it hard to have some of those conversations. And you, know, you just gave a number of good tips, right? To try to move that forward. But now having been in the field for some number of years, if you look back, you know, what, what's the advice that now the older Kevin Garvey would have gone back and given the younger Kevin Garvey to say, hey, this is what you should do to kind of, hey, ease some of those concerns. What, what do you think you would have told your younger self? So one thing that I would love everyone to walk away with, if, even if it's nothing else from these slides, is you had mentioned imposter syndrome, Frank. Know that even now, I think every single one of us tends to have that feeling as well. It's a very natural feeling. And why is it so prevalent within cybersecurity, especially myself as well? Because the landscape is always changing within cybersecurity. So just when you think that you understand one of the technologies or two of the technologies, well, you might get thrusted into a cloud security role, for example. And that parallels very well to some of the on-premise technology, but there's also some differences along the way as well. So the one thing that I would take away and tell my younger self is you don't need to boil the ocean and learn everything. In fact, the last presenter had a great slide about all the different functional areas in cybersecurity. I want to let you in on a secret. You don't need to know every last one of them, which is fine. We're not expecting you to know every last one of them. It's really that curiosity. It's the way that you're going to build up those skills, whether it's through, again, those skills you already have or the skills that you're going to be able to practice you know, outside of working hours. It's really going to showcase the great success. And for, you know, I was an incident response and pure incident response role for a while. Now I'm leading up the incident response functionality at my organization. There have been so many times that I've been thrust into a, an incident response situation where I didn't know the technology. A great example is Exchange. Now, with Exchange and that Exchange vulnerability that just came out a few weeks ago, you know, I absolutely can have a, a good conversation with you about Exchange and what it does. But every last detail of Exchange, am I an SME or a subject matter expert in it? No. But that's one of the beauties of being in cybersecurity, especially some of these functional areas like incident response. We absolutely have to know enough to talk intelligently about it, but there are times and many times, in fact, that we're expected to sort of learn as we go as well. And I think that exchange scenario really tested in a good way that knowledge that a lot of people had or maybe they thought they had of exchange when you're not 100% aligned to Microsoft Exchange. So don't worry about knowing every last thing. I certainly don't. I don't think anybody within the cybersecurity realm knows every last thing either. But there are some great ways to really hone in on not only how you can get experience in a particular area, but then also how to make yourself adaptable to some of the areas that you might not be 100% familiar with. Yeah, Kevin, great points. And you know, related to kind of the different backgrounds in, in cyber and related to imposter syndrome, um, you know, there's a number of people were pointing out that, hey, there's a lot of transferable skills like finance is about risk analysis, risk management, some of these other fields, right? You're bringing this other knowledge to bear in terms of what we're trying to do from a security perspective. And there was one, one comment, one question um, that, hey, you know, you mentioned, you know, you teach the Management 512 class, being a, a cybersecurity manager, being in a leadership type of role, you know, how much does, do you need to, do you find that you need to know the details, the technical nuts and bolts? Um, as you're progressing in your career? That's a great question. One of the best ways that I would showcase, especially in that management and leadership side, is being able to influence that next decision. 
and being able to influence the people to go to the next step. One thing I've learned, especially as a manager, is sometimes when as a manager, you think that, oh, it's really self-explanatory for the next person in line to do X, Y, and Z. Sometimes it's not self-explanatory. So as that manager, as that leader, one of the best tenets of success is to lead an initiative to not only the finish line, but then also to completion as well. And you're measured a little bit differently, of course, when you're in that management and leadership type role. Initiatives are absolutely going to be a huge measure for you. And knowing that talk, knowing what some of the uh, tools and also the uh, conversations are within cybersecurity will absolutely give you a lot of great experience, not just within cybersecurity, but also with your team as well. But let me take it from another step too. I've worked with a lot of project managers who have been incredibly successful being aligned to a cybersecurity role. And again, I'll, I'll let you in on a secret. They didn't really know much about cybersecurity and they were still incredibly successful at executing on a project and making sure that the full project life cycle was seen to completion. And that, my mind is just as successful because you're aligned to reducing that risk within the organization. And something I tell a lot of the folks who take Management 512, you know, we have a lot of different monikers when it comes to our job titles, but we are essentially tech, tech risk professionals. And we're looking to reduce that risk within an organization. So, you know, if someone had mentioned, you can bring in some of your risk background or some of your finance background. Absolutely, that is really needed within the organization. And that's why I don't want anybody to discount the great skills that they already have because they actually might fit within cybersecurity, but you just might not realize it just yet. Well, let me go on to the sample entry level job description. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this because I know that we've talked about it a lot today, but know that look, a lot of hiring managers, a lot of HR professionals, a lot of cybersecurity managers, we have to get a job wreck out. And many times, you know what ends up happening, fortunately or unfortunately, it ends up being a big copy and paste effort from another job description. And that's something that as part of that HR professional series that I'm working with SANS on, we're really trying to figure out the best way to look at job descriptions and looking at how we can make sure that everybody who has the skills for the role, well, they're gonna be able to apply. And we don't end up screening out people just because they might not have a three years of working experience, or they might not have some of the familiarity with some of the compliance frameworks that I talk about. Yeah, well, I say that it's nice if some people have at least a conversational knowledge. It depends on the role, but when I'm doing the interviews, I almost never ask point blank, hey, I need you to tell me about FedRAMP. I need you to tell me about FISMA. Those aren't things that I ask along the way, but I do ask some of the questions that we're gonna go into in just a little bit. And that's why I want to really showcase, I do agree that the technical is a great thing to bring. And we're going to go into how to get some of that technical skill set in the next few slides. But I also want to go into what also some of those soft skills are along the way. And it's really critical that you have that confidence and everybody on this bridge has that confidence that the soft skills that you bring really can make your professional career within cybersecurity. So I wanted you to think about it from an interview type perspective of what exactly are we trying to get at? And I'd like you to practice some of these questions. So, you know, I'll work with SANS to make sure this is a takeaway for you, but I'd love for you to practice some of these questions. And notice that all of the questions on the screen, they're not technical. They are interview questions that are assessing problem solving skills. And I'll go back one slide just to go over that uh, mantra that I tend to look for when I'm interviewing. We're looking at problem solving skills, leading, and in particular leading, especially when you don't have that leadership position and then communications along the way. So what are some of those non-technical questions? And as you look at the slide and you ask yourself, what are some of the best ways that I can answer it? Know that, yeah, hey, there's not always a right or wrong answer, but it's the methodology, it's the thought process that you bring to the table. And we're going to go into some more open-ended questions, and I'm going to give you a little hint on a good response that you can give to a question like this, especially when you're presented to it within a cybersecurity role. And you might be wondering, why do I keep talking about soft skills? Well, because we're, when we're put into a position where we have to respond to an incident, where we have to do a risk analysis of a vulnerability, or we have to look at the architectural design of a brand new solution and look at it from a secure standpoint, well, there's a lot of thought that goes into it. And I really want to emphasize the word thought there because there's problem solving, there's leading, and there's also having those communications along the way. So I'm going to go through a quick example of, you know, 
what you can do as you start answering some of these soft skill questions that you are presented with. And I'd invite you to think about it from three different tenets. One is that problem solving methodology. The other one is how you led. And again, in particular, how you led, this is going to blow my mind when I hear it, how you led without actually being delegated a leader, which is really cool. And then also communication. So in this example, I talk about, hey, how did you lead an operational incident from start to finish? And I'm not gonna read everything on the slide, but a takeaway that I'd love for you to have is, I'm not as interested in you know, what you did for the Hansi keyboard. In my mind, especially as I'm interviewing for a cybersecurity professional, I wanna understand what you learned, what also you were able to do from that soft skills side that really makes you shine and also ends up being a bit of a requirement for a cybersecurity type entry level role. There was the problem solving, looking at what you did, especially unscripted items of what you did in order to get to the bottom of the problem. And I think back to when I was, I had a little bit more hair on my head and I was sitting at the help desk in 2006 and I was looking to see, well, hey, what's wrong? Why am I seeing all these different things pop up on a screen? Well, I wanted to look through the event logs and that was some of the problem solving that I did, very similar to this question over here. What did I do in terms of leading? And again, looking at what decisions you made without having to be told, which is such a strong skill. Well, in this particular scenario, leading the operational incident, we're able to make that decision. And again, I'm really gonna hone in on that word. I made a decision to lead a call. Oh, I hear that in an interview, wonderful words, because I know that you're able to take that initiative. You're also able to lead, even though obviously you're not looking at the right answer along the way or looking to get that particular right answer, you were able to make a decision to move the needle forward. And then also communication, not just within the moment, but then also what you learn from it as well. So in this particular operational scenario incident, what was that good communication, a great interview answer? Well, this individual developed a more formal communication channel with the networking team. And in this scenario, this uh, individual was talking to a networking individual. And then also, how do we make sure we learn from it again? Almost like that lessons learned that we talk about a lot within cybersecurity and a lot of operational items as well. Well, I wrote an article about it where the person made sure that there were some great next steps to make sure well, that they were able to not repeat the exact same thing that happened to them. Now you might be thinking, all right, Kevin, this sounds great. I don't have any of this experience. I don't know what you're talking about, Kevin. It is really tough to gain this soft skill experience. So one thing, I would love for you to take away from this is you don't have to do it just at the office, right? Especially within information security. There are some great groups that are nonprofit groups and they're also available for you to join without any experience in cybersecurity. You don't have to have 10 years of experience to join, for example, uh, the privacy group or ISAC or ISSA. You don't have to. You join, you can sign up for the emails and you get to really understand what that chatter is within the industry as well. And that's a great way of you know, not just understanding what some of the problems are within the organization, but then also being able to take some of those leadership roles as well. So one thing that I've done to build up my leadership skills before I had a team is I did some volunteer leadership work. Well, you might be asking what that is. Well, I'm based in New York City. One of the great nonprofits is New York Cares. New York Cares is looking for a volunteer team lead. What does that mean? That means that there was a group of volunteers that I had to make sure, well, really enjoy their volunteer experience. And you'd be very, very surprised at the very interesting items that come out of a volunteer experience because well, people's paychecks aren't tied to it, right? And you as a leader have to absolutely handle that scenario. And it might sound outlandish that I'm paralleling volunteer leadership to leadership within cybersecurity or making those leader type decisions, but it also really exercised my muscle, my, in the muscle of my head for leadership. And I felt much more confident along the way to make some of those tougher calls and tougher decisions because I'd already done it before. And I did it without having it be part of my role. So you could always be creative in the way that you do that leadership. I could also look at putting yourself in scenarios that I know a lot of people have the cold sweats on, public speaking, or even writing, for example. But know that there are great ways now to really get that experience down and to figure out how you react. You know, as I speak, and I've, as I've always spoken at many of these uh, events, 
I still get a little bit nervous prior. There's nothing wrong with that. But what is great about it is that I know how I react to when I do public speaking, just like everybody else who does, does public speaking. And you'll find even the most prolific public speakers, they get a little nervous still. They absolutely do. But because they've trained themselves to really get into that position and know how they feel, well, they're prepared for when they have to do senior leading uh, briefings to the board or they might have to do webinars, maybe internal webinars at work to talk about cybersecurity strategies. So there are some really good ways to build up those soft skills, even if you don't have the opportunity to do it right now. And I invite you to think about that as you start building up your experience. But hey, Kevin, about soft skills, right? And you might be wondering, all right, Kevin, that's great, but I want you to talk about some of the technical skills along the way, those hard skills. They're gonna mash up very, very well. In the next part of my conversation, we're gonna start talking about some of those hard skills that you may not have an opportunity to really hone in on right now. But at the end, I think that you'll have ample opportunity to practice your craft and to really hone in on it through some of the ways that I'm gonna go over. Now, Kevin, hey, before you go on to uh, you know this uh, your next topics here, there's been a lot of great conversation, a lot of great comments still here in Slack, a lot of interaction. And uh, related to what you were just talking about, this intersection of soft skills and hard skills, and people were mentioning, you know, you were just talking about kind of the mindset. You've been talking about this in terms of how you want to approach this and connecting with people, this, you know, performance anxiety that we were talking about. And, you know, some specific questions are, hey, well, what can people do to make themselves shine a little bit more? What's a good project that they can work on? that would shine on their resume? Or what else can they do to get past HR related to some of these soft skills and this intersection of hard skills that you're segueing into here? I'm gonna go through an example that is really on the top of my mind right now because I was just talking about it earlier today. Well, at work right now, obviously I'm a cybersecurity manager. There's a lot of functional areas. However, on one of our calls, we started talking about working and we started talking about getting back into the office and getting back into some type of schedule. And one thing that was brought up on the call was, hey, if you have any interest, you know, we could uh, start developing champions or leaders to figure out the next ways to, well, really understand how people are going to get back into the workforce. So you might be wondering, why am I bringing this up right now? We're at a cybersecurity event. What am I talking about hybrid workforce? No, Kevin, let's go to the next slide. Well, it goes part and parcel with the question that you asked, Frank, is because it allows me to not only really you know, get my mind a little bit off of cyber in terms of exercising my muscle on other areas, but I also get to network with some other folks as well. And that's just one example of a great way, especially within an organization, you might be able to really practice your soft skills and be put into those scenarios that you're not normally used to, right? I know darn well, I'm going to walk into there and I don't have any of that true, you know, HR experience that is going to allow me to, you know, feel confident in that HR scenario. Yet every single one of us within the organization absolutely is going to be affected by it. And they're looking for a champion. Well, you know what that means to me? They're looking for somebody to lead. And they're looking for somebody to lead without being told to lead as well. And there are a lot of great nuggets within an organization where you'll see these opportunities come up. It could be business resource groups. It could be initiatives such as what I just talked about. It is a great way of getting some experience. And no, it's not going to be comfortable. But that's the whole point of it, right? You, know, you really get to practice all those skills that, hey, when you are put into a very similar scenario at the job that you're in, well, you're going to have that practice. And more importantly, you're also going to have that confidence along the way as well to be able to do that. And you could do that through non-work environments too. You know, I go back to my slides and I think of all those information security groups that I talked about and that we're going to also share at the end of this presentation as well. Well, there's also different positions within those groups that you might be able to help out and join. It could be a president type of scenario. In fact, I was president of a Toastmasters group here in the New York area. I got some great experience along the way, experience that I was not really expecting. And that cost me very, very little money. And it wasn't something that I needed to be at a job in order to do. And that volunteer experience also falls into that. So again, there are a lot of great nuggets along the way. You just have to be cognizant of when they are presented to you. And then also number two, being able to have that confidence to take it on. We understand that you're not going to understand a lot of the different things right off the bat, which is fine, nothing to worry about but you're getting that practice. And most importantly, you'll find, especially when you are not doing this in a role that is paying your paycheck every month, people are rooting for you. They want you to win. They want you to succeed. 
And that's one of the best ways to do it when you have great champions behind you. And you have a great way of showcasing the fact that, hey, I actually do have these skills. And you'll find that it comes in very, very often within your careers, especially within cybersecurity. Yeah. We start talking a little bit more about that technical side as well. And one thing that you can do, especially as somebody who, yeah, you're, you're very interested like I was in the weeds. You wanted to you know, sort of like pry apart a computer. Could be opening up the computer. It also could just be, again, going through the logs and trying to do some troubleshooting along the way. Well, it's a great way of getting some of that technical experience that you might not have right now. And you might be asking me, well, why and how could I get that technical experience if I don't have any privileges within my office environment in order to get some of this? I'm gonna take care of that for you. There are some great ways that you can get some experience without really ever walking into an office before 2019, of course. So is this you? If it is, I'm telling you, you are a great candidate for a wonderful cybersecurity position because the way that you're thinking right now, getting into the weeds, looking at building up a website or being active on user forums such as Quora, this is exactly what I would be looking for within a cybersecurity professional. Whether they're experienced or not, it showcases that they absolutely love not only digging to get the solution, but really thinking on their feet and trying to figure out the best way to shine within their role. Now, is this gonna come at a cost to you? No, not necessarily. There are some great winds of change within security and especially within IT as well of that on-prem instance. And I, I think back to when I was still in college, I built up an Active Directory lab and it was wonderful. But the thing is I had all these different computers all over the basement floor in order to build up my lab environment. I had to get into these interesting scenarios with Microsoft because they had a license and I only had a 30 day license to utilize. And then I had to burn my CD drive nothing to worry about anymore. That is something that you could still absolutely do, but there are other ways to really test out some of your technical abilities and to really challenge yourself along the way. And three that I would absolutely recommend to everybody is to get a little bit more familiar with the cloud environments. And this is for two different scenarios. One, well, in most circumstances, you could sign up for an account for free. And you can sign up just to make sure that you are getting some of that experience without really having that um, not only expertise, but also the responsibility along the way as well. But then too, it's not as messy. You know, you're able to build up an environment, you're able to build up some test environments, and you'll find as, you know, especially within cybersecurity, we are moving over to this cloud-based infrastructure. And I'm seeing that more and more folks are able to get some of that experience without actually being responsible to get that experience. So three different ways that you can get that and really be a top candidate for a role is to start looking at some of these cloud providers and look at Amazon Web Services or AWS. Well, AWS is a great lab setup. If you go to the website that, again, we're going to share afterwards as well, you can practice in a live AWS environment with real world scenarios. Now, some of them are not cybersecurity related, but that's okay. You don't have anything to worry about. You're gaining a lot of that base knowledge that you know, in the past, it wasn't impossible to get, but it was a little bit tougher to really ascertain. You really had to put your mind to it. Now, you can get that just by signing into AWS Labs and walking through some of the great labs. And then have some confidence when you go into a, now it's going into a little bit more of a technical interview, where they might be asking about some of your knowledge and interpretations of AWS. And the same could also be said for Azure and Google Cloud as well. So there are free ways to get an account and they could even give you a 200 or $300 credit as you see on the screen. And then at the end of a particular time, well, then we have to figure out what are some of the free services that are offered through Azure or Google Cloud, or you might be able to, well, maybe sign up again or even more. Maybe you do wanna pay for a very small account and you know it's totally up to you if you wanna do that. But within those 30 days, especially if you are very vigilant on being able to log in, working through some of the lab scenarios like on AWS or walking through some of the other areas with Azure and Google Cloud, you're gonna be able to have, especially within 30 days, a very good understanding of some of the basic tools and terminologies that are being shared against all of the cloud environments. And more importantly too, because you might be asking, well, hey, if I'm only learning about cloud, Am I going to be foregoing all of my on-premise or some of those legacy technologies that are still in data centers or are still sitting at an office environment? The short answer is no. You'll find very quickly that a lot of the skills that you're going to pick up, again, for free and very easily with AWS, Azure, or Google Cloud, 
they absolutely do parallel in many of the terminology and many of the uh, thought processes on-prem. So I don't think that you're siloing yourself by just going over to the cloud. In fact, you're really growing a lot of your experience beyond, I'm gonna let you in on another secret here, a lot of what a lot of other folks within the industry right now even understand about cloud security. So you're even walking in with a little bit of a leg up. And a lot of that is through some of the great environments that are set up for you for free that you can just sign up for via some of these links over here. So I highly recommend that you get a little bit more comfortable with maybe just one of them. You don't have to know all three, but just one of the cloud environments. And a lot of that terminology, a lot of that technical experience that you're gonna get, well, that's gonna translate very well, not only in an interview setting, but then also within a setting in the environment, in your enterprise environment. And one thing what's great too, is when we start looking at, well, AWS, Azure, Google Cloud, and you start answering some questions, we go back to some of the example interview questions that I had just brought up. What were some of the problems that you ran through as you were trying to get your AWS lab set up? What were some of the problems with Azure? How'd you get past it along the way? And this is something that, again, we'll be sharing out after the presentation as well. Hey, Kevin, you know, while, uh, while you've been sharing all of this knowledge in Slack, it has been a, a, a whirlwind here of a lot of great information. Not only have been people chiming in with some tips themselves, but they've also been debating pizza toppings along the way here for some strange reason, right? Uh, sorry for all you pineapple lovers out there. People love pineapples on their pizza. You know, hey, I personally don't understand it, but that's besides the point. Now, um, you know, I know you're going to talk about some other ways here to gain this experience and, you know, practice here, and you're going to mention CTFs. There's been a lot of, a lot of conversation about CTFs here, capture the flag challenges. And in, pri in a prior life, in prior roles, you know, hey, when somebody comes back and wins a CTF, you know, we give them, I give them a lot of credit. We make it a little bit of a marketing thing internally and, you know, make sure to highlight their accomplishments. But, hey, Kevin, what about if, uh, you know, somebody doesn't always finish in the top one, two, or three? What if somebody's just participated in the CTF? How does somebody go about getting that credit for that in terms of the experience that they've learned? And what are some projects that, you know, how, how might you want to highlight that in terms of your potential employers, current employers, and um, in terms of that overall experience? What, what do you think? So a great example of that that I went through a few years ago was with a SIM solution called Splunk. And they have a boss of the SOC challenge, which they call bots. Well, in that challenge, not only is it something for you to get a little bit more familiar with Splunk with, but it also ended up being an area for me to really understand some of the AWS logs as well. So we walk you through the scenario. I went into this boss of the SOC challenge environment and there were probably, let's call it, 300 folks that were in the room in the New York area. It was a pretty big challenge, right? And they had the leaderboard up and they had some great food along the way and they had some good music. It was wonderful. I walked in there not really knowing much about uh, Splunk and then also not really knowing much about AWS logs in particular. And I knew I was gonna be walking out of there, certainly not being in the top one or 2%, which was perfectly fine with me. And I bring this up because it's one of those great things that you could bring up in an interview and potentially, especially as an entry level employee, trying to really showcase yourself as someone who's going above and beyond, you can put that on the resume. When I look at the resume and I were to see boss of the sock challenge, I can guarantee you, I'm going to look at that resume and I'm going to respond accordingly and probably ask you, hey, how was it? What did you do? You know, and probably go through some of my experiences as well. So. My answer is really, you end up developing a little bit of a bond with someone, especially if they've taken one of those challenges, number one. But number two, even if they ask you, one of the greatest answers that, excuse me, I would expect is, hey, it really wasn't all that easy, but that's okay. We are not expecting you to be in that top one or 2%, especially for a lot of these entry level roles. I think though, as we look at the boss of the stock challenge and I talk about 300 folks that were in the room, that's 300 folks. It's a lot of people, right? But that's not the entire workforce that wants to get into cybersecurity. So those 300 people that were doing that boss of the sock challenge, well, I didn't exactly ask them, were they already in security or were they with other groups? But they absolutely were gaining some of that experience at the hands of well, the vendor as well. And also really focusing in on how they could be successful in future interviews just by having a conversation about it. Actually, Frank, I think back a little bit to when I applied to a financial role. This is way back in 2014, and I was a cybersecurity analyst. I want to let you in on a hint. The first thing that he talked about wasn't any of my experience with cybersecurity. It wasn't anything about IT. He actually asked me about my supermarket experience from when I was in high school and college that I still had on my resume. And he 
used to work at the exact same supermarket chain. And we ended up bonding over it because, well, there were a lot of things that we needed to problem solve at that organization. And later I learned, well, he asked me, wasn't as much to reminisce about the supermarket, but he wanted to understand some of the challenges that I not only faced, but also walked through as well. So things that you would never expect, especially an interviewer to pick up on, you absolutely will, but you gotta put yourself in some of those positions at times. Whether it's a role from college and high school days, or whether it's a boss of the sock challenge or a CTF type of a scenario, you don't have to be the top 1%. You don't have to be the one that's gonna finish at the top. Your participation, well, even though it was 300 people, that's still a drop in the bucket for the amount of folks that do wanna get into cybersecurity along the way. So hopefully that helps as well. So know that again, a lot of that theme, you already have a lot of that experience, just making it shine really does make a big difference, especially at some of these entry level roles along the way. Kevin, that's great. Hey, you know, just a quick check in here. You know, we've got about uh, five minutes to go, roughly speaking. And, uh, you know, I know you've got a lot more information to share. So just a heads up here as we kind of get through the, get towards the finish line. Yeah, absolutely. Well, and again, a lot of these slides are going to be able to be downloaded and presented to everybody who's on the, uh, the webinar right now. So you're going to look at some of the technical things that I was talking about, looking at setting up that Azure Active Directory. Well, and again, I, I might be throwing out terms that you're not 100% familiar with, which is fine. Well, all you have to do is look at this website, and there's many other websites out there just like it. So walk you through how to build up the lab. And as a cybersecurity professional, well, we absolutely not only have to protect many of these cloud environments and some of these directory service environments, but we also have to understand a little bit about them as well. And again, getting our hands dirty allows us to do that. So no, I put a, a great link up there, but any link or even a YouTube video will be able to help you out. And some CTFs or some pen test hands-on experience is also gonna be really beneficial for you as well. And no, there's a lot of great free items out there as well. I'm gonna talk about a few of them here. Hack.me and Over the Wire. Now, if you're really interested in the penetration testing side of the house, I know we've talked about that a lot today, you can look at Vulnhub or Hack the Box. And these are things that I've utilized as well in order to really start building up some of that pen testing experience. And it's not just for a pen testing role, especially within security operations and that blue team hack goes on. Many of the things that I learned within that red team development, well, actually parallels very well over to what I do with the blue team. And I know we talked about that a little bit today as well. But one thing I'd love for you to take away is just because you learned what you think might be one subset of cyber doesn't mean that it's not applicable somewhere else. It absolutely is. And it's very applicable in many of these free hands-on areas as well. And again, we're gonna be able to share this out. And some other creative ways to gain some of that technical knowledge at work, you could develop a rotation. And just, these are things that I talk about in the HR series as well that I have already started working on and we've done a few webinars on and there's three other webinars where we're gonna go into how to gain some of that technical knowledge in that creative way at work. But know that everything that I'm talking about right here I actually did cover when we went over some of my personal experiences. And also one thing I would highly recommend, especially if you're in the working world right now, is talking with your manager or management about some stretch goals as well. And looking to see how, hey, maybe instead of grabbing that cup of coffee, because we can't do that right now, maybe you set some time up with the networking professional or the Windows info professional and help them out or job shadow them for a little bit and get that okay for management for you to really gain some of that confidence along the way as well. And of course, SANS has some great free items as well, whether it's Cyber Aces or the summits like you're currently on right now, the webinars, Tech Tuesdays and white papers. And lastly, one thing I love for everybody, especially if you have IT knowledge, don't discount it. You'd be so surprised at how useful that technical knowledge is. And I can't tell you how many times I've talked to a technical professional who's been in the, the industry for years and they don't think that their skills parallel over to cybersecurity. I'm here to tell you, it absolutely does. So don't discount what you've learned, especially within an environment as well. So in conclusion, there's one thing I want you to take away. You already have a lot of cyber skills with you. You've got some of the great soft skills. You've got some of the technical skills that you're gonna be able to learn after looking at some of the recommendations that I've given you. And know that once you've gone through it, whether it's gaining some of that experience or being able to play around and getting into the weeds a little bit more, you absolutely are gonna have that confidence going into an interview with your dream employer and your dream job. 
So with that, thank you very much for the opportunity. And I'll be on the Slack channel as well to answer any questions along the way. Frankly, Kevin, hey, that was awesome. Before we close out the final and most important question here, what is your favorite pizza topping? Oh, oh without question, sausage and pepperoni. <laughs> All right. Hey, well, there it is, folks. With that, we're going to go ahead and sign off and we'll see you guys uh, online, Slack and at the next event. Thanks a lot, Kevin. Thanks, everybody.